to be in this beautiful space with so many beautiful people. So really, we are eager to learn from you. I want to introduce, you may see the shadow person up here with us, our dear colleague, Jeff Jones. Uh, Jeff is a leader in uh, SDS and Up Against the Wall Motherfuckers in New York, and then uh, with the Weather Underground, and is an environmental activist and works with labor and uh, changing the planet forces together. So we wanted to bring him up here with us and just uh, look at all of you and learn from all of you. So our thought was to say two things and then get some questions and comments back from you and be off and running. Is that fair? Yeah. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just going to say one thing and then pass it to Jeff and then to Bell. Um, for me, I think, I think one of our tasks is naming the moment framing where we are, who are we, and where are we, and obviously we're in a very magical space right here, uh, but we're in many spaces, all of us. So what is, our, what is this moment? And primarily this is the job of the next generation, of you, uh, to name the moment. But we want to be with you, so we're trying to name the moment too. Um, I would like to posit that uh, the greatest challenge before us is war and peace, and the United States is a force for war all over the world, as well as at home here. And we are now defined by the number of military bases, the organization of the world to be plundered the last drop of dollar that can be wrung out of the world's resources, the world's labor, the world's people, uh, the world's waterways including in the United States. So we have war abroad and domestic security at home, and it's turned us, I think, into Sparta, where the most of our money is going for war and occupation and drones and targeted assassinations and killings, and yet we see our children coming home, as they did 45 years ago, throwing their medals back at the generals and seeing what has just been done uh, in the name of freedom. Uh, rather than really in the name of changing the world and changing the planet as we know it. So we just came from uh, the last year of organizing a big demonstration in Chicago, our hometown, uh, uh, against NATO forces. We feel totally alive with the Occupy forces that came up this year. We feel totally alive with the prisoners. Uh, who have launched a hunger strike from Pelican Bay. Imagine prisoners, you know, we live in this gulag, right, a, prisoning, a, a, a prison society as well as a militarized society, and the idea that the prisoners in Pelican Bay, where right, there's an attempt to bury them alive, these young guys uh, who have been incarcerated and sent away, are able to speak with a voice as loud as the Occupy voice from inside, yeah. writing letters to Occupy, asking for solidarity back, 
There's so much to pay attention to, so little time, so hard to do it. So I'm going to introduce Jeff, Bill, and then hopefully just jump into a conversation about what is to be done. Thank you. Well, you come up on stage. I actually have, this is not my first time at the Oregon Country Fair, um, and I'm happy to share it with them. Um, we have been together since uh, Bill and I, uh, we were demonstrating against the war in Vietnam together in October of 1965, and you and I were doing anti-draft work in New York City starting in 1967, so it's been a long time. And, uh, yeah, uh, as... Uh, uh, a month ago, they were key organizers of the demonstration in Chicago against NATO. I came out from New York where I live now and joined them on a march that was uh, a very powerful march and resulted in uh, supporting the uh, Iraq War vets throwing their medals back while uh, Obama and the other NATO leaders were uh, planning the next stage of the occupation of Afghanistan. Uh, but I am primarily an environmentalist these days and I see a straight line from the work that we were doing uh, it's scary to think how many years ago uh, but if you recall the war the, the, what the United States uh, attempt to control Vietnam uh, was where a lot of us learned about imperialism what is imperialism but the control of other people's resources what do we do with those resources well besides abusing the people in order to get control of those resources we burn a lot of them and that creates global warming there's a short course on global warming it starts with imperialism and the only other thing i want to say before we have the conversation about where to go is there's a pathway uh, there's a pathway out we need to transform the way we do business in this country and we need to transform to a post-fossil fuel economy. And in so doing, we're going to be able to create a lot of jobs for a lot of people. And uh, uh, since we're sitting here in this beautiful woods, and uh, we have to protect these woods, we have to protect the planet. I wanted to share sort of the uh, clean energy, green job strategy that uh, some, a lot of us are working on. So thank you for letting me uh, sit up here and be a part of this today. If I can know your name to introduce you, who are doing such a beautiful piece of art here to help us translate. Laurie. And this is Grant. Grant, Laurie and Grant. Thank you so much for being here. Wow, <clears throat> it's great to be here with my two longtime comrades, friends, partner of 42 years. 42? 41. <laughs> It feels like 42, but in the best sense, 42. I was telling John earlier, I, I'm still trying to make it work. I'm hoping that maybe, maybe we'll be able to make it work. Um, it's just terrific to be here, and, and it is our first time, and, and uh, overjoyed to be a part of it. Last night, my mind was blown seven times before we got back to the parking lot, and I expect today to be a lot more of the same. And I think that one of the things that... that we should all remember is that is that um, while dissent is very important and dissent will save us, it's very important to have a balance between joy and justice. The way Rosa Luxemburg said it was, you know, in a letter from prison, she said to a friend who was whining about how hard it was to be an activist, and she wrote a letter back and she said, you know, this is during World War One, and she was in prison for resisting World War One, and she said, you know, first of all, stop whining. And then she said, which I think is always good advice, and then she said, uh, secondly, the important thing is to learn to be a mensch. And then she said, I can't translate it for you exactly, except to say that a mensch is someone who loves her own life enough to enjoy the sunshine, to, to, to love the sunrise, to take care of the kids and the elders, but loves the world enough to put her shoulder on history's wheel when history requires it. Figuring out that balance is yeah. life's work. <laughs> joy and justice. Dissent will save us, but we must have joy and justice. And to me, this is a joyful uh, song, every part of this. And, and, and let's also remember that history calls us, and, and, and we have to respond. Um, 
Brenda didn't mention Maimie in a moment. Again, I'll just take a few minutes. But uh, the carnival of the national elections is upon us, and the carnival is coming to town. And one of the depressing things about that carnival, and this time more than ever, I mean, the corruption of money, what could be more obvious, what could be more clear? And it's always been true, but this year just washing in billions of dollars. So it's, it's an oligarchy, and it's the oligarchy's parade. But the problem is when the carnival comes to town, we tend to get sucked in and we tend and, and I'm not urging people not to be involved simply to say if we are involved that we should always be remembering that what really changes history is movements on the ground it's what we build on the ground it's not which of these guys we elect particularly it's how we learn to reframe the issues and then connect the issues. One of the great admirable things about what Jeffrey's been involved in is connecting labor with the, envir the radical environmental movement. That's important. We have the same interests. We don't always see it, but it's true. And we have to find a way to talk and listen and be in dialogue so that we can make those connections. Burned in as well, connecting war with, you know, with criminal justice, connecting criminal justice with feminism with the rights of queer people. All of these things are linked. We have to find a language to link them and to be compelling about that. Um, I don't, I, you know, I think quickly, a, a quick history lesson, you know. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, who passed the most far-reaching civil rights legislation since Reconstruction, was not part of the black freedom movement. Franklin Roosevelt was not part of the labor movement. And Abraham Lincoln never belonged to an abolitionist party. So what was happening that made those things happen? That's what we have access to. We have no access to the White House. We have no access to the Pentagon, Congress, Wall Street. But we have access to each other. And that's good enough. If we can use it, we'll be right back. Last word, I, I, somebody said something, a young person said to me something about being from the 60s, and frankly, I don't identify. I mean, I do identify in one way, but I'm as much from the 40s, 50s, 70s, 80s, 90s. In fact, I'm of this generation. We were all early members of SDS, and our little SDS membership card said, we are people of this generation, born in, in at least modest comfort, housed now at universities, looking uneasily at the world we inherit. I still have my card. I still believe that, that I'm of this generation. I'm not, I don't remember December 31st, 1969, looking at my watch and saying, oh shit, it's almost over. I gotta get high. It wasn't like that. I'm of this generation and so are you. We're sharing the planet, young, old, in between. And we better get busy or there won't be a planet to save. The scent will save us. So, uh, could we take two comments, questions, paradoxes, paradigms, and then we'll just come back and forth? Yes, one. Yeah, so I work with Occupy Labor we'll Solidarity. Repeat. We'll repeat. Okay. I work with Occupy Labor Solidarity. Okay, Occupy Labor Solidarity. So one of, and some of the environmental groups that we occupy Hanford. One of the things that we've learned is that there is a contradiction between jobs and environment. And one of the ways that we've learned to keep people working together is to remember that the 1% that the ruling class built the contradictions between jobs and environment to suit themselves. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So he's, he's talking about Hanford, which is... Hanford, a nuclear weapons facility up nuclear north. Nuclear weapons facility in Oregon. And big coal that comes In Washington. Through. Yes, in Washington. Yes. Okay, Jeff, can you repeat? You want, yeah. yeah. We're talking about the contradiction between labor and environment. So How do you always build? Always the argument is jobs, yeah. right? We'll, do, we'll build more prisons for jobs. We, we, we'll build the tar sands yeah. pipeline for jobs. So one of the ways of keeping the two groups together, because we're all people, workers, Liver, people who have to live is to remind the people rather than to fight and argue with right. each other is that it's the one percent who built those contradictions for us to deal with and it's going to take us a while together to untangle it okay i'll just have a quick comment i mean i agree with you of course yeah and uh, uh yes the idea that there's a there's a common enemy between the uh, the the 
the people fighting, those of us fighting to save the environment and those of us, including uh, people fighting to save their jobs because people need jobs for their families who work in facilities like Hannaford, which are bad for the environment. Mm -hmm. Where I'm from in New York, we have the same fight over the Indian Point nuclear power plant. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, uh, the labor movement really cannot agree to close the Indian Point nuclear power plant because they would lose 800 jobs. We make the point, you, the 800 people who are there now will have jobs the rest of their lives shutting the plant down. Yes. They just can't pass them on to their kids. Yes. But you have to have a positive alternative, and the positive alternative is things like renewable energy. When you're, when you're Specifically when you're talking about energy, we have a goal in New York of uh, tr trying to get the governor and the legislature to agree to a 5,000 megawatt uh, solar energy capacity by 2025. Right now we're at 100. 100 megawatts of solar capacity, we want to get to 5,000. That's going to create a lot of jobs, and that's how you build. That's how you build that alliance. Okay, sister. Can I see a sister? Yes, please. Could you address tactics? Please? I'm like nonviolence is my thing, and I work with the Fellowship of Reconciliation, and I just I know there's a lot of controversy in history about the 60s and the weathermen and the SDS, and what would you say you've learned at this point in your life regarding tactics? Um, Nonviolence and diversity of tactics. Okay, so sister's asking about address, going right into the history's contradictions. Um, <laughs> tactics. How do we decide? She's a nonviolent uh, activist. How do we decide if we embrace the diversity of tactics? How do we fit tactics into our politics and our strategies? Okay, I'll tell you, uh, we had a, two really great experiences this year. Of course, we're, we're uh, assigned by history uh, as the uh, violent edge of the 60s movement, which we weren't, and we don't, ever, we don't really think that we were. We were militant, uh, we believed in aggressive confrontation uh, with the forces of military power and racism, uh, but we actually think, looking back at the history of the 60s, that, it, that our side, just as with Occupy this year, was remarkably nonviolent and restrained for yes. my diverse, anarchistic, incredibly creative, humorous, lively, imaginative, artistic rebellion. Yes. Our side was restrained. And I, I think when you look at that history, it's astonishing to look at how many ways in which you can be nonviolent and put your body on the line and be creative and write and make people laugh. Let's not forget the laughter part of it. Um, so I'll just say one word about that because it came up, of course, a lot during the Occupy. We've been traveling and speaking to people about it. And it's come up in the NATO demonstrations. Um, Bill and I happened, you'll find this ironic, those of you who remember, to be trained as peace guides for the, uh, by the 8th Day Center for Justice, by the radical nuns. And speaking of the nuns, can we all stand up for the nuns? I know we're all getting ready. Oh, in America, and I'll tell you a quick story. Um, uh, Sister Kathleen, a dear friend of ours in the Eighth Day Center for Justice in Chicago, was doing these Peace Guide trainings. And she said during the course of it, she was telling us, you know, keep your hands down, intervene if there's a crisis, if somebody's being targeted, you know, walk up to them, keep your hands down, ask how you can help if somebody's being singled out because they're an Arab or a person of color or disabled or an anarchist. You know, we want to, we embrace all of them in this march. Um, and, uh, and she said, now for me, for example, I'm just a middle-aged old white woman and nobody's going to target me. And then there's a long pause and she said, unless it's the Vatican. <laughs> then you better protect me. <laughs> and these, you know, nuns on a bus is going across the country. Um, so invite them here to Eugene, nuns on a bus. Give, give them your solidarity openly. In whatever organizations you work in, write in and say, we need these women on the planet and we need them working with us. Cool. That's a way around saying that I think that, of course, nonviolent activism, nonviolent direct action is my favorite tactic. Um, and I think that that doesn't mean nonviolence as it's preached by the powers that be, the most violent 
people ever seen in human history. Yes. You know, Dr. King said in his famous speech at Riverside Church in 1967, he said, the greatest purveyor of violence on this earth is my own country. That was an astonishing thing for him to say in the middle of the Cold War and coming out against the war in Vietnam, the aggressive imperialist terrible war against criminal war against Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia. And of course a year later he was killed. However, I think that that's still true. I think that the greatest purveyor of violence on this earth is our own country. And it doesn't give me pleasure to say that, but it does give us a particular responsibility to stop the violence of the United States being waged on our own people yes. and the people of the planet. I want to just amplify one word. I mean, you say that's why King was killed. In that same speech, and if you read the speeches of Martin Luther King from 1965 to 1968, you'll blow your mind because the king that they have prayer breakfast for is nothing like the living human being who made a connection between racial justice, economic justice, and global justice. And when that connection was made, the radicalism ran so deep that he became a major, major threat. Remember, too, that in those years from 1965 to 1975, 6,000 Indo-Chinese a week were being murdered. 6,000 a week were being murdered by our country, by our government. And the response, Bernie says it was restrained. It was restrained. That doesn't answer anything for today. We still have to figure out, and you raise the question of diversity of tactics. When we were in New York um, at, at Occupy, there was a great raging discussion about this. And, and one of the things I think they were concluding is that those who think of themselves as anarchists and wanting to take things further have to also remember to take responsibility for the whole. People like Sister Kathleen are always saying, but here's our points of unity. Let's remember our points of unity. If you, if you want to go burn the American flag at the NATO demonstration, go do that, but take responsibility for your brothers and sisters. The other thing is we have to be careful, be wary of raising nonviolence to a kind of a, a, a religion or an ideology that, let, that, that dissolves us, that makes us unable to, to do anything. So, so, you know, I often think uh, George Orwell wrote a wonderful, wonderful piece about Gandhi in which he said Gandhi is the one person who, one pacifist he knows who answered a question that no Western pacifist would answer. It's the end of World War II, and a journalist asked Gandhi, yes, but what about the Jews of Europe? And Gandhi's response was, they should have lined themselves up and all killed themselves. Now that was consistent, but it's weird. You can find that, you can look it up. I'm not putting Gandhi down. Who could dislike the guy who brought the British Empire to its knees? I mean, it's wonderful. But I think you should also note that we are up against a very powerful adversary and enemy. I think we should, the best thing we have going for us is our own unity, our own community, our own ability to be creative, and our imagination is bigger than theirs and that's what we have that's the best thing we have I'll do one two three maybe we'll let three go in three questions, questions and then we'll play with it yes stand up and shout in 2008 Sarah Paterin called you a terrorist I'm wondering how did that have an effect on you two hundred years of your life in Chicago did you get any death threats oh. <laughs> She's asking, you heard the question, Sarah Palin called Bill a terrorist in 2008 during the campaign, and she's wondering how it affected our lives and whether we got death threats. Um, yes. So, I'm um, involved in both the Occupy and the Peace Movement in Eugene, but I think we need to find ways to work together better. What happened, at, what lessons from Chicago that could help us in Eugene and elsewhere, about oh, how we bring these question. movements together? Great, okay. Occupy and um, peace. the peace movement. How can we work together? How can we bring ourselves together? Who, who else do they call on here? Somebody. Okay, yes, sister. Hi. So um, I'm going to be, hopefully I'm going to be a teacher soon. Woohoo! Yay! 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 Yay!
and I'm wondering how can I keep that in a field where really being political is um, kind of looked down on. So. Excellent. Okay, the sister's becoming a teacher, and she wants to know how to hold on to radical spunk uh, in the face of Trump becoming a teacher in America today. Okay. Well, you start with the unity of occupying peace. No, you start with <laughs> okay, okay. Just to get Sarah Palin out of the way. Yes, yeah. uh, in 2003, it's worth remembering that, that that whole narrative about Obama, that the narrative that said, what do we really know about this man? He's a mystery, but he hangs around with some very bad people. A black nationalist minister, a Palestinian scholar, and an unrepentant terrorist. And the third one was assigned to me. Um, and it was Hillary Clinton who started that narrative, and it didn't work for her. And then Palin and, um, and McCain picked it right up. And Palin said at a rally in, in Michigan, um, here's a man who, who uh, thinks so poorly of America that he pals around with terrorists. And that became the phrase. Um, Yes, we got death threats immediately, um, and we've gotten death threats most of our lives, but, but we got them very intensely during the 2008 campaign. And um, uh, the impact was that the Chicago police ex put a detail on our house and kind of kept an eye on us, which was very nice of them. Um, the, uh, but the, I thought they had an eye on us anyway. But, um, but, you know, we live in the safest neighborhood in Chicago. Louis Farrakhan lives a block away, Jesse Jackson over here. You know, so we have the, Obama's the Obamas in the green zone over here. So, yeah, it's a very weird neighborhood. But, yes, it had an immediate impact. Our response was to be quiet through the whole thing. And the more they yammered about us, the more we shut up. And the more now, wait, Bill crazy. has to explain that it's not in his nature to be quiet. Oh, sure it is. <laughs> it is not in his nature. In fact, the 11 years we were underground and were fugitives, he likes to say that we never told him we were underground because he can't keep a secret. <laughs>